All right, guys, I'm going to start this week's episode with a short story about a good friend of mine who, I'm not going to name him, but this is a friend of mine who always has time for fun. He is always, and I mean always, away on holiday. He's always traveling. He's always going surfing or windsurfing or cycling or some sort of entertainment going on in his life. He lives a pretty envious life, if I do say so. And anyone who hears that and says, that's the kind of life I want, do you want to know what his secret is? Well, to, to, to kind of answer that very quickly, I can just explain that he has simply been very, very religious about funding his pension for his whole life since he was young. He was f- putting money aside into his pension. And he's an ambitious guy, worked hard, Um, but was always careful to throw money into the pension rather than sort of living a very lavish lifestyle that he could have at the time. Now, I understand whenever I use the word pension, a lot of people's eyes, including my own, uh, could start to glaze over. And I know there's a lot of reluctance for people to kind of even think about sort of starting a pension and things like that. But This is the one trick that my friend has really mastered that got him into this really great position he is where he just has a fantastic lifestyle and he has this completely passive income that is pretty much guaranteed for the rest of his life. Now, why did he get involved in pensions? Well, because smart people tend to do this. Free money. When I say free money, I mean genuinely, if you get involved in a pension, if you start a pension at a young age, it is like basically picking up free money that is lying down on the ground. Now, a lot of people will wonder, what do I mean by that? There's so much tax benefits to a pension. You don't pay any tax on rental income. You don't pay any capital gains tax. The amount of money that you put into the pension is completely tax-free. When you put money in from a company, the company doesn't pay any tax on the money that was put in and it reduces its tax bill as well. So you're basically reducing all of your taxes by putting your money aside into your pension. What is the one downside? Well, the one downside is you cannot access it for many years. But that, in a sense, is also the advantage because how many of us are tempted to dip in every now and then to savings and things like that. And this is one of the things about a pension. It takes that temptation away. And so every penny that you put in, it just, it sits there growing tax-free for years and years to come. My guest today is going to explain one of the reasons I wanted to bring her in is because she and her husband have bought two properties through their pension. And For a lot of young people listening, I do think you should pay attention to this particular episode because this is your opportunity to get in line for that fabulous lifestyle at some point in the future. It's one of those things. My friend that I'm talking about earlier, he he's just a normal guy, but he had an abnormal pension. And that is what has given him that ability now. For older people listening, you're going to find this particular episode interesting because you may be interested to hear that it's not too late even to start in your 50s. Now, obviously, the younger you start, the easier it's going to be and the better it's going to be. But my guest today actually didn't start until she was in her 50s. And so anyone, finally, anybody who is in the construction sector, if you're in the trade, if you're listening right now and you happen to be a carpenter or an electrician or anything like that, this episode is for you because It is by far the easiest way for you to squirrel money away for your retirement. A lot of people will go out and they'll buy a property. And the reason they buy that property is because they want to have something for retirement. Well, don't have it for retirement in your name. Have it for retirement in your pension and then get all of the advantages, tax-free money. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring my guest on today. And so without further ado, my conversation about pensions and property with Miss Christina Buckley. Christina P. Buckley, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. 
I'm good, Gavin. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. Thanks, Christina. I am um, for our listeners. I've obviously given a little bit of an intro, but for the benefit of the people listening in, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, I mean, you're a property investor and you're a property developer, but you also do some consulting in the area of pensions and buying property in your pension and stuff like that. So I'm be interested just to if you could share uh, maybe a little bit about yourself and your background as a property investor. Like, how did you get involved in property in the first instance? Yes, well, I have, um, we developed property, I suppose, in 2005. We bought a site and we were going to develop it out just in relation to a house. And then we ended up looking at it to see if we could build more houses on it, you know. So that's really how I suppose it started out. And were you involved in property prior to that moment? Uh, like what what made you think that it was buying a site and building a house that was the first time you ever got involved in property, was it? Um, no. Well, John's family is, um, you know, property, I suppose, and constructions in the blood. His uh, father was a general foreman of SISC, uh, Johnny Buckley, for 40 years. So I suppose they're the whole family are literally uh, carpenters, plasters, uh, electricians. Yeah, you know, the, every cousin, every relation, you know, so we have a platter of trades in the family. So that's actually, um, I suppose, um, to, to buy a site and build a property seemed possible. But build five probably would have seemed impossible, but it was the crazy times it was at the time. And once we had planning, the site was worth half a million and then going down to the bank to borrow a million pound or a million euro. It didn't seem as it didn't seem as such a crazy, um, I suppose, uh, once once we've added value through the site. So that probably, I suppose, um, it got us started and uh, I, I often think sometimes you know where we uh, you know when people say an accidental landlord I, I wonder are we accidental developers because as I say it wasn't our intention but once we built the five houses then we were really on a roller coaster ride to um, you know to try and I suppose understand rental and tenants and tax and PRTB registrations and of, you know we're student pacific accommodation there so that's our registration and um you have to understand i suppose all, all the ins and outs of that well it sounds like yeah that's i mean 2005 that was the the, the middle of the of the celtic tiger and everyone was kind of going crazy borrowing money easily it obviously wouldn't be so easy today to repeat that very same thing but yeah. um in terms of your you know, decision. Did you initially do that in your pension, or was that initially in your own name, or like that that initial first deal? When did you? How was that one structured? Was it just in your personal names, yourself and your husband? Yeah, so it was in the personal names. I wish it was in the pension. <laughs> now that, as I say, sometimes after uh, twenty years in the property industry and developing property and renting property and. <laughs> Uh, doing renovations and refurbs and everything else and all the, that's involved with the banks and the ups and downs, the recession. Uh, I look back now and I, I do think, have we been maybe a busy fool, you know, in relation to when I see uh, the advantages of buying property in the pension Um, obviously the tax free uh, growth in there, you know, uh, it just uh, it just makes so much sense. So, no, we actually bought those properties personally and um. I often listen to your podcast when you were talking about, you know, owned and everything personally. And it always uh, there was one particular podcast. Uh, I it, it probably struck a chord with me, given that I had been through the recession as well. And I, I understood, you know, hanging on by the fingernails. We did. Yeah. We had 50 percent loan to values and we had trackers and we had everything. I mean, I, like I'm very prudent, you know, tick all the boxes. I'm I'm bulletproof, you know, which I look nobody was bulletproof. But uh, I always remember you saying you were talking to a guy and he had all of his companies. He had all of his properties in companies and you were literally had all your properties like us personally. And you were like, why are you so calm? And he was like, bank, take them, the bank, take them. I have my family home, I suppose, protected. And that yeah. makes a difference, doesn't it? You know, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing is, is, is what I kind of try to say to people is that, you know, everything that you're doing at the moment is always, you know, like the advice in the moment can be quite different to what it will be at some point in the future. So you can make all these great plans today, 
But a few years from now, you don't know what the regulations will be. You don't know what the law will be. They might bring in some sort of tax change or something like that. So you obviously, you put your best foot forward, but you don't know what's around the corner. And I know that I invested in a thing that way back in 2005 or something like that, we invested in something and it was a 20% tax rate. So we thought this is a fantastic investment. This is a great way to go and do this particular deal. And we did this deal. And then over the recession, there was these subsequent tax hikes that were brought in and we ended up, it ended up going to 40%. And then today, the same investment I started at 20% is now 60% tax uh, for me personally. And so it's like, my God, like all of the advice that we got at the time was that this is a great structure. Fast forward 15, 20 years, and it looks like a terrible structure. So it's always good to kind of diversify, I guess, you know, on that basis that you really don't know. However, well, let's let's not get off the track. I think that the talk about the pension is very important because there's a couple of things that you and I talked about just before pressing record uh, in terms of, you know, the way it can be used by trading companies and things like that. And so I think we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. One of the first questions that I want to get is uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people out there that will be reluctant at the idea of investing through a pension because there's a kind of a sense that if you do that, it's locked away. You can't touch it for years and things like that. And I mean, which is in a sense true, but that is also the benefit is that there's no temptation there to dip in and dip in the next minute you've spent all the, the savings and stuff. Tell us some of the pros. Somebody said to me the word creditor unfriendly in the pension, which I thought was a good way of putting it. So, you know, that that can be an advantage, you know, what people yeah, say. If somebody, if somebody goes after you personally, you can actually, your pension is completely protected. Isn't that right? They're less likely to just say creditor unfriendly, I think is the term they use. But I mean, I, I presume that, yes, it would be difficult to access somebody's pension. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah would make you a little bit safe, like what we were talking about, the investment companies earlier on. Not that they'd make, not that anything would make you 100% safe, but I suppose safer. Well, I'll just, like one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to jump on this topic is because um, I can remember back in 2000, and I think it was probably around 2005 or 2006, and I was doing a, a big transaction with uh, another chap. And this chap was very, very prudent and had a big pension. And he had started it before they brought in that 2 million cap. Um, so, so this guy had, I think he had quite a few million in his pension. And I can remember we were, we were looking at buying a building together and I can remember saying, oh, this is a really nice building. Let's, you know, let's go off and have a look and talk to the bank about getting debt and things like that. And I can remember saying like, listen, I'm talking to my bank about getting debt you should be talking to your bank as well, just to make sure that we keep this deal moving. And he goes, oh no, I've been buying it through my pension. And I said, oh, are you going to use debt? And he goes, I know, I'll just buy it with cash. And I was like, this is a building that's over, like his share was going to be over 2 million cash. And he had that money just sitting in this pension, like ready to go. And I can remember kind of just being kind of, whoa, like that is really like just... The fact that he has that much cash just sitting in his pension, like easy to access, he could just jump in whenever he needed. And every penny that this deal was going to generate was going to be completely tax free for him. So since then, it's been really, really kind of interesting for me, the idea of this. But I have spoken to different advisors, and I guess this is where you're going to sort of come in and clear up some of the things. But some of them were definitely suggesting that it was quite difficult to buy pet property through a pension, that there's a lot of restrictions and that getting getting kind of the deal done is a lot of work and it might discourage some people. So why don't you explain what's involved and how did you sort of go from through the process yourself and explain like what are the different hurdles that are in the way uh, compared to, say, just a normal transaction? Yes, well, I suppose... The first thing you have to consider is it is all arms lent, you know, like you'll find a property and then you'll be able to ring your pension trustee and say, OK, we've found the property and, um, you know, maybe gone sale agreed or he, he'll ring the auctioneer and they'll go sale agreed on it. So it is the pension company buying the property and not you. So I suppose that's the first thing. Um, 
you know, I suppose because it's been bought in the pension and it'll be mortgaged. Now, that's if you're mortgaging, as you said, that guy there didn't need to mortgage. And, uh, you know, a lot of people probably don't need to mortgage. You know, it's something that I looked at and I just decided, uh, I think the gearing uh, a 50 percent loan to value in the pension um, with, uh, the you know, ICS to LISC was who, who we dealt with. I suppose I am speaking, I will just, I suppose, reiterate, this is my own experience. So yeah. um, I'm not a pension advisor. I'm basically just, I suppose, I can, you know, talk about my own experience from that point of view. So this was my own experience buying two properties in the pension. Um, we were a little bit late to this party. I'd always seen, I suppose, the advantages of buying property in the pension. And I'd al already always seen, I suppose, that the pension was a good idea because I was, you know, I, was, I used to study ACCA and I was, you know, going to all the continuous progressive development courses. And like your story there, they were always talking about, you know, that you could have up to two million uh, of a standard fund threshold in your pension. And like when you think of that's a, you know, a tax free uh, structure, you know, it's um, where else would you put your money? I suppose if you sat down and think about it, yeah. suppose, for a lot of people, that's such a lofty uh, amount. They think, well, look, you know, it's that's that's crazy. I'll just rule that out. But I would try and urge people to access it by 100,000 or 200,000 or 300,000. It doesn't really matter the amount. It's just benefit from it at some point in your lifetime. So in our situation, we had we found two properties and they were actually next door to one another and um, they had been empty for uh, some time and I was driving by them every day. So I contacted the auctioneer and um, I gave the auctioneer then the pension company's details and they basically uh, secured the properties and we went sale agreed. Um, we had can, you just, can, I, can I just interrupt you there? So just to get an idea of the timeline, because, I mean, you, you know, you ring up an auctioneer and say, I'd like to put in an offer. But in this case, you're not putting in the offer. You're going and you're finding out what's the sale price. And then you're going to your pension company and you're saying, I found two properties that I would like you to buy on my behalf for my pension. Can you ring up the auctioneer and make an offer? And this I've already spoken to him and this is what they'll accept. And that's given, then you handed that job over to the pension. I suppose we were sort of sale agreed, you know, like obviously the auctioneer knew that we were buying the funds through the pension. So we had kind of agreed. We had, uh, we had gone sale agreed on it, you know. Okay. So the deal was off the market at this stage when you yes. got the, the pension involved. Okay. The pensions involved then at that stage. But um, obviously we had to do a uh, proof of funds and things like that. So that was obviously shown that it was the pension funds that were buying it. And then um, we explained that we were going to be doing some gearing on it. Um, uh, which uh, the properties then when the bank came out, they had to look at them and they said, OK, they're in a good area. They're going to rent very well. And, um, you know, they're looking, I suppose, at the current market value of the property and they're looking at the rental on it. They know it's going to be managed in the pension. And I suppose from the bank side of things, they have the little bit of comfort that um or, or a big bit of comfort, I suppose, that the rent is going to be rolling in and there's going to be no tax on it. So they know there's headroom in there. And yeah. then um, I suppose the 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 idea then, because it's it's non-recourse lending for the banks and um it's ring fence then. And it's very um, I suppose the property company I used, the pension company I used was uh, Grant Thornton Pension Trustees and everything was in a unit trust. So I had actually never seen something so broken up in different sections in all my life. I actually seen one property go into one unit trust, another property go into another unit trust. And then basically, you know, you had obviously your own pension account separate to that and then the pension trustee. So myself and John, even though we were married, buying two properties in our pension and uh, we could have been complete strangers because obviously it's managed by the pension trustee and yeah. an auctioneer is hired and you can recommend an auctioneer. Um, and now that's not to say that they, they could go, you know, they have to go with that one. But if you have property experience like I had, they took that on board and I recommended an auctioneer that wasn't, you know, obviously a family member or whatever, you know, there is a lot of arm's length rules and that's what puts people off. But it was. Yeah, this is not something that you, you couldn't be buying something from your brother or your sister or something or or something from your, you know, your husband. You want to kind of like get put something into the pension that you already own. None of that would be permitted. 
within yeah. it, you know, and that's that's a massive question at the moment. You know, I'm on the committee of the IPOA, I'm on the board there, and uh, a lot of the the members obviously uh, selling their properties that they own personally, and um, you know, we're sort of saying to them, God, it would be fantastic if they could put their, you know, probably the most asked question is, can I put my own property in? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. You can sell that property and buy the property next door and put that. It's, I just see it to be very sad, you know, uh, pro- people selling a- and getting out. Uh, and I just think maybe if they looked at the pension option, if it's an option for them, obviously we had a trading company and we were able to fund our pension through that trading yeah and build up the pension as I said we were a bit late to the party so we had to use a mechanism that was called max funding you know so that's based on salary and service so they calculate your salary they calculate your service how long the company is opened your age we were 50 we wanted to retire at 60 so they were kind of saying okay there's only 10 years you're heading yeah. for retirement and you know you have to catch up on your fund so we were able to to, to to get that revenue approved then that max funding um in and around I think was 175 each you know the type of structure that we bought the two properties in was called a SAP so it was a small self-administered pension if you want to buy a property you want a non-standard PRSA or self-administered PRSA and that seems to be the one now that has been changed a little bit in the finance act for the people that are listening here right now um, the structure that you used is no longer available, but there is still structures available that would allow people to make investments into their pension. In terms of the benefits, we were talking about this earlier. So let's say you're a, a carpenter or a plumber and like everyone at the moment is out the door with work, they're flat out. And so theoretically, you're doing quite well at the moment. You're making some good money in your company and the company the, the cash flow is building up. I get a question I get a lot from my listeners is that you've got, you know, I, should I buy through my company? Because they've got cash sitting in the company. So they're thinking to themselves, you know, I'm sitting on 60 or 70 grand. Um, should I use that as a deposit and but get the company to buy it? And what it sounds to me like a far smarter, more prudent thing would be to put that money into your pension which is completely tax free. You won't, and it would also mean that you don't actually have to pay the 12.5% trading tax because that's removed as well from the tax net. And so instead of having 70 grand, you'll have the original 80 or 90 or whatever. You can put that into your pension and then you can use that pension to go and, and borrow uh, and, and buy a property. Is the, is, the, is, the, is the funding or the mortgages and stuff through a pension, is that still? Uh, a route that is possible yeah yeah so just to to answer your question there in relation to the construction industry I think it's a very good industry that should maybe look at this because when I was in the Crow Park Summit there with the pension summit recently they did say that that uh, there was some concern raised about I suppose people retiring earlier and uh, maybe living longer and the construction industry is one industry where um, the guys do tend to and girls uh, do tend to retire Retire earlier, you know. Um, maybe yeah, you're not walking around scaffolding in, in your seventies, ch- typically speaking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they it was a pension was more important, and it was a couple of big construction companies there discussing their concerns for their staff, and they were saying the pension is probably more important in that industry, you know, for that reason that they're not they tend not to work till they're 65, you know, and, you know, for, you know, because it's such a physical job. Um, so, yeah, I think construction is, is a great industry because it's a trading industry and a trading route to uh, fund your pension if you're self-employed or have a limited company. You know, it needs to be a limited company. Um, then the employer will always be able to put in, the employer director will always be able to put in a much higher sum than the employee director, you know. So if yeah. you, the employee was to try and fund their pension, let's say they're under 40 and the cap on the salary is 115, they at 20% would only be able to put in 23,000. But the actual employer 
uh, would be able to maybe put, we'll just say, for example, I know it sounds a lot, but we'll just say, for example, 100,000. So if the employer was putting in 100,000, the employee um, is getting a much larger contribution. So that's something that maybe if it's their own company, speak to the accountant, if it's a board and the directors, there's other considerations. If there's shareholders, these things can get very complicated depending on how big the business is. And I yeah, suppose yeah. all of that has to be checked with the accountant but that would be the route I would be taking and I suppose the most important thing I want to say there because it's the first thing that came to my mind is that you don't want property in a company a trading company because if you're going for retirement relief or entrepreneurial relief and I'm just seeing this from my own point of view now as I say always looking at accounts you know it just makes the company uh, messy in relation to an investment company there it's a different tax rate it's rental it's it's it might affect something as huge as retirement relief. They could be aiming to take that 750 out at retirement relief and pay no tax on it and then be told, well, you know, you ended up with a couple of properties in there. It muddied the water and you're not a clean case or you're not good to go and you have to do something else. You know? That's the thing I, I've said multiple times when I get asked that question is, first of all, look at the pension. But second of all, whatever you do, don't buy the property with the company that you're out doing the work in because that it does muddy the water but also if you say you make some sort of an error or your mistake and somebody decides i'm going to go and sue that person for the job they did in my house or something now suddenly you have a property there that looks actually looks like it's worth going after whereas you could have that in a separate entity and the trading company could simply lend the money over to the entity and that's it you're you've solved that problem but you'll still have a lot of tax that's the problem yeah yeah, most people would have, you know, the kind of umbrella of companies if they're going that route. They might have their trading construction where they'll do all their refurbs. And, and then, as you say, that they generally try and keep that quite lean and mean, I would say, if that yeah. if you'll understand that. And uh, exactly for the reason that you're saying there, you know, it's a working thing. It's like your working current account, I suppose. Yeah. And your investment company then might be the separate one where you'd hold the assets and then they might have a holding company above that so that structure is quite efficient you know when you have a uh, big enough uh, amount of properties to to to, to do you know um, tell me this christina one of the things that we were chatting about before we hit record was that the um and this is something that's in this market a lot of people out there will be thinking you know it's 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 awful competitive this market like if you go out to, to buy the the three bed or the four bed you know you're up against tons of different different people you mentioned a case of somebody of a company um, and it had a number of directors and they decided, let's go and buy that apartment block. And we'll, we'll, the, the company essentially makes the offer, but the purchasers are actually the pensions of all the different directors. And so you end up with you know, four or five directors, each owning four or five properties in an apartment block. And it, it means that the company controls the building and if, and the owners are basically all in those different pension pop you know funds d- different buckets we'll say that mm-hmm. own it and so you get the benefit of not if the property is not kind of out there in the general public this is actually controlled by you and your colleagues but you're doing it in a super tax efficient way that's that was really interesting well, it's controlled by the pension company and it would be managed by an auctioneer, you know. But um, I suppose the tidiness maybe of having those four apartments, uh, let's say, on, on first floor. And then, you know, maybe the guy that owns the, the next four apartments and the, the guy that owns the next four apartments. So in a situation where uh, it was 12 apartments and this was um, what they were actually going ahead to try and do. Now they're in the process of doing it. So uh, it hasn't completed. So I wouldn't sort of, I suppose, flag that as as possible until it's right, right. But they are actually looking at uh, buying four apartments. They're separate folios. So the pension are happy with that. They yeah. can get hearing on the apartments because they've had a look at them and they've said yes they're you know in a good area and they're going to rent well and then um in relation to the other directors then are looking at at buying the other apartments in the block so they'll all be separate into separate pension companies even if they had even if they all had different pension companies if they had one was i itc one was newcourt one was um, 
And mm. yeah, Grant Thornton Pension Trustee, it doesn't matter. You're buying separate folios, separate apartments, and you're basically doing what you were saying there earlier on. That guy is doing picking up the phone. He's ringing his pension trustee and he's saying, I've got a self administered pension, which is really the key because you get to say what you invest the money yeah. in. And it's not just property. If you want to invest the money in stocks and bonds and shares, or you want money invested in. So that's a very interesting space because, as you say, it takes you out of the market where uh, it's very, I suppose, overheated. And you might be able to look at the bigger, bigger, um, you know, apartment block. And the real, I suppose, catalyst there and the reason that that's now probably possible as well is because if the employer is putting 100,000 into the pension for the employee and um, because of the changes on the 15th of December um, in the Finance Act um, last year there would have been a situation where the employee would have been charged um, benefit in kind. And that's removed now. And that has been re- removed this year. So employers now are in a position to be able to put uh, maybe a lump sum because the cap has been removed as well bar the standard fund threshold obviously is still there so there was big changes made around the 15th to December in the Finance Act I suppose to make the PRSA and the pension more um, amenable to a lot of people and yeah. for employees as well great progress has been made around the pension and people have to keep an eye on it because there is some really good changes coming down the track and I think I think it is to uh, encourage people to put money into their pension to whatever they want to invest in. So I know yourself and myself, Gavin, you know, love property, but I will be honest, you know, they see it as a very... um, um, illiquid asset, you know, that might want need to be sold at a bad time, you know, where values yeah, might be down, or which where. is always a risk, you know. But like the thing is, is what what, what I think is is great about it is. This is effectively free money that you just it's lying there. You just have to pick it up. And it's like no benefit in kind. That's huge. The fact that there's there's no cap there. That's huge. The fact that most people that are trading out there, uh, you know, the profits sitting at the company, it's already a low taxation situation because it's only twelve and a half percent tax in a company. But you can actually remove that even as well, you know, and just keep, you know, the bare bones that you need to kind of keep the company going. So it's it's free money. I think probably one of the things that make people reluctant to use a pension is just the fact that they think, you know, this is like a, a black hole. You, you take your 20 grand and you throw it in to this company and they oh, we'll manage it for you. And then, oh, oh, dear, the stock market went down. I'm sorry, your 20 grand is only worth 15 now. Like. That would have been the perception before and, oh, they're taking fees and they're doing. But if it's a self-administered pension, like you're talking about, you put your 20 grand in and the 20 grand sits in a bank account and it doesn't have any expenses except for your your pension cost for running the pension. And you decide what to do with that. So if you put 20 in and you do nothing this year, but then you put another 20 in next year, now you have 40 grand there. You might decide that's a deposit I'm going to go and put on a property or something like that. And it everything is completely tax-free. One of the reasons a lot of people are pulling out of the market is because of the taxation and the fact that, you know, there's quite a lot of tax on landlords. So if it's through a pension, that's a further, you know, benefit, I guess, to, guess towards landlords. Yeah, sorry, just on that point there, yeah. I see uh, buying property uh, through the pension as a very good solution uh, for landlords if they have access to the company either through a trading company and now actually I believe even an investment route so that's quite new as well and that might be around some of the changes if they have a salary uh, on their investment company there uh, has to be a salary obviously in a limited company an investment company but it's always been a trading route but there now looks like there may be avenues in relation to that so that's very early days on that as well but um, the PRSA um if it's a question that it's um, there is an employee employer relationship and there's a salary established, it may even be a route from an investment company now to invest in their pension, which I think would be fantastic. Pension is a long term structure. So when I speak to, to, to members of the IPOA and I ask them, why have you bought a property? They generally tell me that they've bought a property uh, for their pension. You know, they're worried about, you know, when they get to, you know, they get older. Yeah. 
and it's you know poverty at that age and not working and maybe not being able to work or bad health it's it's really a concern you know and it kind of you know is a big issue to them so that's why they bought the property you know so I, I'd be thinking well if it's for your pension why isn't it in your pension you know yeah, yeah. exactly that's a really good point with the pension, everything is seen. So the two properties I have in the pension, they'll basically send me an email and say, this is the insurance quote. Are you happy with it? I'll get an email, you know, CC'd probably on an email once a month. And the auctioneer will say, this is the rent gone across the Grand Thornton. This is the expenses. This is my fees. And, um, you know, whatever else is going on, you know. So you're very, um, it's self-administered. You are the beneficiary of the property. So you will be kept informed and you do get to have a say i suppose as to what happens to it provided um, it's at an arm's length yeah yeah it's led to somebody you use an auctioneer and it's lent led to a non-connected party that's very very strict rules but i see the rules like looking through a window it's 100 percent clear you know yeah, there's yeah. No surprises with the pension it's very clear. It's very well spelled out. Like at the end of the first year, they valued the property. They looked at what was in the pension. They minus the debt and then they charged um, whatever percent. I think it was one percent. And tell me this, Christine, in your particular case, you have two properties and they're actually HMOs. They're, they're multi-room properties. So a lot of people might have thought that that, that wasn't uh, a runner, but you've actually, that's how you went about it. So you have a, a pretty good return coming from your property. Um, and that is managed by the auctioneer that you've brought in to look after the collection of rent and things like that, is it? Yeah. So the, the pension company don't, um, don't, I suppose, allow um, renting per room. So just to be clear, I bought big properties. So there were one was a, a note. Um, it was a bed and breakfast originally. So that's the one that has the eight bedrooms in it. Okay. And the other one is a six bed. And that was a property built um, probably about 25 years ago. And it was built on the site. So it had a, a big detached property. So they're unusual on their size and certainly unusual in our area. I searched a long time for a nice big property. I wanted a big property and I hadn't got the funds for the you know, the pre-63 on the South Circular Road. Uh I had to go looking and uh, we were very lucky then to find these properties. Um, So the way they're rented is um, through the pension. It's a a, a standard uh, lease, you know, so... They're, they're they're near the nearer hospital they're near you know and we kind of uh, the auctioneer then led to a group for the six bed because that was six bedrooms and and two bathrooms oh, yeah two bathrooms and then the other property had um eight bedrooms and eight bathrooms in it and a wc downstairs so it actually had because as I say it was structured as a bed and breakfast originally so that kind of um was let then to a company and the same thing it was right. left So it's effectively it's a HMO, but rather than you collecting money from individuals, you just rent you're renting it to a a company who put who gives it out to the eight people that working for them or whatever way they want to kind of organize it. The company, it's a corporate let on the bigger property. So the company then takes the the lease. So the auctioneer rents it to the company. It was a foreign company and they wanted to bring over their staff and they wanted to make sure they'd be all secure in one place and they were able to give them two cars or whatever so they could site and um yeah it worked very well that way so yeah so the that's the, a very clean way of doing it actually yeah it to a company so for the rtb registration uh it has to be a lease and um in some cases obviously if it's a commercial property a license but um just to be clear it can't be rented on a room by room basis or on airbnb which is something that has come up time and time again because right. airbnb is a trading aspect that's like a hotel and you can't have a hotel in your pension you can't be trading in your pension so uh, if you buy a big property you have to look for the right strategy or have your auctioneer look for the right strategy in relation to renting that particular property you know so as I say the 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 both properties now are let and uh, they are returning very good yields. In terms of uh, Christine I mean just you're in the market uh, and you're on the IPOA like what what is your view just kind of changing the topic slightly like what's your view on the market at the moment like how do you see things playing out um you know we're in a housing crisis but at the same time the affordability 
has been, you know, getting worse. And I know one of my listeners wrote to me recently and they have a HMO and they said that it recently turned cash flow negative for them. So um, it's, it was the first time that I'd heard that. And I was kind of thinking, oh, OK, so just opening it up to you, just you, what's your what's your view in the market? And, and do you see it going up or down or sideways or what would you think? I suppose because I've been in the market a long time and I've seen the ups and I've seen the downs, it's just another cycle to me. You know, I still think property is a good is is is, you know, it's a good idea to buy property. And I still think it's a good idea to rent property. But you have to be active. You know, you have to really work hard at it. A lot of people think it's passive, you know, and unfortunately it's not. Um, And I always try and look for well, what can you do? You know, a lot of people spent an awful lot of time and energy raging against the machine and saying, you know, we can't do this, we can't do that. So, you know, instead of all of those things that you can't do, let's look at what you can do. Yeah, you yeah. can do property and your pension. I think they'll borrow, um, the lending is at 80,000 from ICS to list. So technically, if you had um, 200,000, if you had 100,000 in your pension and you borrowed um 80,000 and 80,000, that's 160. And I was on uh, the Liberty Blue um, webinar down in Waterford and I was blown away at the great value properties they have because people would say to you, you can't get anything under 200,000, are you mad? But the rental yields as well were very good at 1,000, 1,100 city centre properties, really good. So I was blown away at the value there. You have to find the good. You know, there's no You have point- to go out and look. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, if you're living in Dublin, you won't have heard of a property for you know with any value but if you look outside of Dublin there's actually tons of value out there and the yields I have a friend working uh, living in Carlo town and um, he's bought like five or six properties in the last two or three years and those properties are yielding 15 to 20 percent uh, in terms of you know a gross yield so and that when you say that to somebody in Dublin, they think, you know, there must be something wrong with them. Do you know what I mean? Because how could it be so high, you know? But that that is actually what's quite, quite common uh, outside of the of the kind of the, the big urban centres, you know? Yeah, you do have to look at the right property and with the right hat, I always say, you know, like when you bought your family home, you had one particular hat on and you were looking for the south face and back garden near the right yeah. You know, of the rest of it you know you take that hat off when you're looking for a buy to let and then when you're actually looking for a pension property you take that hat off and put another one on again because even a buy to let is different I did have one lady um, I know that uh, was was looking at buying a property down in Limerick and she picked an absolutely fabulous property it was about 10 miles outside the city it was a you know detached it was a bungalow it was fabulous like room for a pony I said to her you know fabulous yeah unsuitable 100% for buying in your pension you would be better off buying something in the city or you know within commuting distance of you know a big city or you know this this place that place and sure I ended up showing her something that was two up two down in Germany and she just thought I was absolutely off my rocker but I thought she was off her rocker because at the end of the day this is a pension property so you're trying to buy something in your pension that's going to rent and um, you know properties appreciate in value and stuff. 15 yeah. minutes 20 minutes on a bus route to the city or you know five or ten minutes to walk in distance to Lewis uh, is going to be a much much better you know it's the rent role I'd be more concerned about in the pension than nearly the value obviously you want capital growth I mean who wouldn't and that'll go into your ARF and when you um, pass away I suppose the the ARF then is inherited by your family you know so with your estate and that's quite um that's quite tax efficient as well at 30 percent. For people who don't understand the reference to ARF, can you explain that? Yeah, so it's an approved retirement fund. So you will basically open your PRSA or whatever uh, type of pension you have. And then that will basically be the mechanism that will run, let's say, for me between the 50 and the 60. And then when I, I basically get to retirement age, then um, they it's will say, OK. 60 now we're now converting it so would you like to sell the property at that stage would you like to move the property into the earth now I suppose 
um, I would like to draw down, obviously, the 25% tax-free lump sum. Um, who wouldn't? It's probably the only tax-free lump sum you're ever going to get. So you'd like to take advantage of that. So you'd have to say to yourself, well, is the cash there? Is there enough cash there to do that? Yeah. And move the property into the earth. Now, your mortgage on on, on the ICS, the LISC, uh, mortgages are 15 years. So you will have a situation where you could move the property with the remaining mortgage still on it into the earth, you know. So that's your approved retirement fund. At that point, you can draw down between 4% and 12%. So at 4%, we're looking at maybe 25,000. And my husband will be looking at about 25,000 as well. So that's kind of, you know, the way we're looking at that. And we're saying that would work out really well with the tax-free lump sums if we had any mortgage left on our family home to maybe clear that, have a lump sum in the bank and yeah. have some there. Comfortable, yeah. yeah. They could be maybe eight years away from actually drawing down the state pension as well. So that's the other thing. People are living longer um, at the the um, the pension summit in Crow Park. They said um, that anybody after the age of 2000, which is my two sons and probably a lot of people's children, yeah. uh, over, you know, after 2000 is going to live statistically till 100 you know, so that's very interesting. So, you know, I can see that generation want to wanting to retire at 50 and then they're going to live till they're 100. So they'll have 50 years to fund. So yeah. pensions are only going to get more important, not less important as time goes on. And people have to look at it, look at their pension, look at what's in the filing cabinet, take it out, have a look at it. If they've had a couple of jobs and they have a couple of pensions, talk to a financial advisor and see, can they be amalgamated in? to one because that's another thing people tend to forget about them and just think you can't do anything with that and if your pension maybe in your job is a particular type of pension that you can't you know be self-administered on you can't you know say where the funds are invested you know there is other structures that are are big structures or big companies that you can't do that maybe you can open one personally and have your own pension I see this I suppose where I'm quite passionate about it is, is I see this as, you know, why aren't we leaving school with a pension account? It's yeah. a bank account. It's like it's actually a bank account. Now, it's a bank account you can only put money into and it doesn't come back out, you know. Uh, but, you know, I think if every Leave and Cert student left, uh, you know, secondary school with, a, you know, a PRSA bank account and understood that this is their money, this is their fund, this is their life, you know. And yeah. then when they get targeted at the higher rate of tax around the 40 percent mark, if they were to channel that money into And then even as you were saying earlier on, the likes of having 10 or 20,000 in the pension, there's plenty of things you can invest in. You could say silver or I know the property bridges peer to peer lending at 10,000 or 7 percent return. I mean, some things obviously more risque than others, but, you know, depending on what you want to do, stocks and bonds and shares, even, you know, somebody of that age getting an understanding of the stock market by investing through their pension and growing their pension and being there when they're 50 saying well I did that you know I was involved in that you know that's something I did. Tell me this uh, Christina in in terms of uh, I know we're getting towards the end of our time here the uh, I'm going to be asking you if people want to reach out but before I do my final question is um, what advice now in your 50s would you give to your 20 year old self if you had the opportunity? Don't buy a house and a business when you're 21, (laughs) because that's what I did the year later. Um, No, I don't regret that. I have to be honest. Uh, Probably had a lot less holidays than some of my friends and didn't definitely didn't drive a fancy car until now. Uh, It's probably the first time I ever bought a new car in the last few years. But yeah, I don't regret that. That's probably uh, probably been the making of us, you know, being entrepreneurial and setting up a business young. And um, I loved that uh, the fire that comes with that young age and just, you know, nothing is impossible. You know, you you can do anything you put your mind to, you know. Yeah, Um, mindset is critical set is so key uh, I was actually looking this morning at a picture I have I was going I'll send you the picture it's um but Pauline uh, McCardle she's a local um 
uh, artist here in Dublin 12 and she did a fabulous picture from me of the giant causeway and you'd have to see it and I know this is going to be lost in the podcast but I'll send you the picture to put up in the on your your website but you can actually see all these steps you know oh, wow. Beautiful, serene uh, pasture at the top of a hill. And when I look at it every day, it motivates me because I just see all the little steps you have to take in life to get where you want to go. And I just sometimes wonder, well, where am I on this, you know, process now? Am I here? Am I here? Am I halfway up the (laughs) hill? And I, what really makes me curious is you can see what's over the hill. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to the day of actually making it to the top and looking over the hill and seeing what's there. I'll have to get to draw me another picture and say, OK, <laughs> <laughs> what's yeah. over the hill? What's, what's this? on the other side? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Christina, thanks so much for your time today. If people wanted to reach out, I know you do a bit of consulting for companies and stuff like that. What's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so you'll see there. I, I'll um, I'll send over to you my uh, email address and uh, my website, and uh, I have a can- calendar link thing then as well. Oh, so someone could book in at time. That yeah, there's a scan code there. If you hold the phone up, it'll bring you straight into my calendar. And um, I really just to say advice based on what I've done, you know, and I try and demystify it because you are going to need a group of professionals to do this. You're going to need your pension trustee, you're going to need your financial advisor, and you're going to need your accountant. But I mean, when you think putting a team of those people together around you, or even talking to the likes of myself or anything that you're afraid of or worried about or don't want to say out loud. To anybody because there's a lot of things and I know going through the process myself I even found there was an awful lot of things that I was nervous about you know and as I say I have the accountancy background and I have uh, you know the understanding of the pension and property and it was still daunting you know so if you could actually talk through somebody that's gone through the process and they can explain it to you I think that can be very valuable and uh, I'm happy to help as I say the consultations calls is probably the, the small part of what I do but at the same time I'm very passionate about this space and I do think it's opened up for some great advantages at the moment for people to take once they know that it's now there that the advantage is there and they need to see it you know brilliant all right Christina I'll put the link to your email and uh and your website and stuff in the show notes and if you're watching on the video guys I'll be putting the picture that she described up on the screen so do check that out Christina, thanks so much for your time and uh, good luck with everything you're doing. Thanks very much, Kevin. Thank you. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Christina today. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up. This does help with the podcast. Now, whilst today's topic is, of course, important, it is important that you learn the other tips and strategies for getting into property and investing in property. And so I am going to put a video to my right here for you to watch next on that very topic. And as I say every time, if you haven't already, please do consider subscribing. You guys are awesome. I do enjoy looking at the comments that I receive at the bottom of the video. So please keep on leaving your comments and I will see you back here next week.